Homo neanderthalensis, also known as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, was a late archaic species of Homo sapiens that separated from modern human lineages no earlier than 600,000 years ago and had virtually vanished from Europe by 40,000 years ago. During that time, they established themselves in many different environments in northern, southern, eastern and western Europe. Neanderthals lived in a wide range of environments, from the colder regions of northern France to the warmer regions of Mediterranean France. Environmental changes are likely to have had an impact on their access to resources over time, and they clearly adapted in order to survive this long. Along the way, European Neanderthals constructed intricate tools, intentionally buried their dead, drew mysterious symbols on cave walls, utilized ornamentation and symbols, had a complex spoken language, and mated with modern humans. Far from being primitive, they were pioneers in chemistry, engineering, and symbolic thought, a lineage lost to time, but one that deserves its place in our shared history. Our perspective of our closest human cousins has changed over the last few decades, from nasty ape-men to clever, archaic human individuals. Our comprehension and appreciation for their cultural sophistication has only recently expanded to include their intelligence. Only in the last several years, with new methodologies and a shift in focus, have we begun to really examine and comprehend the use of chemistry in Neanderthals' culture. The more we study about Neanderthals, the more we discover that the biological and cultural differences between them and us were minimal. Given that we coexisted and most likely interacted with them for thousands of years, learning more about them may help us better comprehend our own history. Scientists now know a great deal about French Neanderthals, including their hair color and mating patterns. Still, a fundamental question remains, how did they light a fire? Archaeologists have long known that Neanderthals, such as the family seen in this 1926 artist's rendition, used fire, but they could have simply relied on naturally occurring lightning strikes and forest fires to fuel the flames. A new theory regarding certain strange Neanderthal artifacts implies that our distant cousins could really start a fire from scratch. Excavations at the 50,000-year-old Peche de Laz site in southwestern France turned up blocks of manganese dioxide, which is common in the region's limestone deposits. Archaeologists originally believed Neanderthals utilized the material as a black pigment to paint their bodies. However, a new team of academics claims that they also used red ochre and manganese dioxide for more than body decoration. What if the Neanderthals were not just survivalists, but chemists and engineers in their own right? What if their use of red ochre, manganese dioxide and tar-like substances was not only practical, but deeply symbolic, reflective of a culture more complex than we ever imagined? These questions challenge long-held stereotypes and invite us to reimagine the world of our ancient relatives. For centuries, Neanderthals were dismissed as simple brutes, their extinction seen as an inevitable consequence of their inferiority to Homo sapiens. But recent archaeological evidence from sites like Peche de Laz and Le Moustier in France suggests otherwise. The study of pigments, adhesives, and even skeletal remains from these sites paints a picture of Neanderthals as resourceful, intelligent beings who manipulated natural materials for purposes that likely went beyond mere survival. Why did Neanderthals collect red ochre? This iron-rich pigment, found at numerous Neanderthal sites, has sparked debate among archaeologists. Some believe it was used purely for practical purposes, such as tanning hides or treating wounds. Others suggest a more symbolic role, perhaps even as an early form of body art or ritual decoration. The discovery of ochre-stained tools and bones at various sites suggests its deliberate use. If Neanderthals were merely interested in function, why choose a striking red pigment when charcoal or other more readily available substances would have sufficed? Could it be that red ochre carried a deeper meaning, a way to mark identity or communicate social bonds? The evidence from Peche de Laz suggests that Neanderthals had an eye for aesthetics as well as function. Another item found in a nearby French cave appears to be an oil lamp. Specialists are currently investigating whether the object has any colours or soot elements that could assist in determining the type of fuel utilised at the time. 
Indeed, there are two red spots on the cave's walls that are not ochre patches, and this colour is caused by the surface of the wall being heated by a lamp's wick. The larger spot is situated above a little concave basin that appears to have served as a lamp. The concavity is primarily composed of manganese oxide, which is used to light prehistoric cave lamps. The second location is on a vertical wall, and there is a little flat section that could have supported a small bowl used as a lamp. One of the most intriguing findings at Pectolais is the presence of manganese dioxide blocks. While it was long assumed that Neanderthals used these for body decoration, researchers now propose an alternative. They may have been used to start fires. This is no small claim, as fire mastery in extreme cold would have granted Neanderthals an enormous survival advantage in Ice Age Europe. According to the researchers, the selection and use of manganese dioxide for fire-making is unknown from the ethnographic record of recent hunter-gatherers. It therefore provides potential significant insights into Neanderthal cognitive capabilities. In the cave, more than 250 blocks of used manganese dioxide were discovered. Pigments were used on worked leathers, clothing, tents, proving that well before the appearance of cave paintings in Europe, Neanderthals knew how to handle colouring materials, and that they did not wait for Homo sapiens to give their everyday objects a symbolic dimension. European Neanderthals were among the first engineers and chemists, producing one of the first types of glue from a mixture of raw materials at least 40,000 years ago, the analysis found. Experimental archaeology has demonstrated that powdered manganese dioxide lowers the ignition temperature of wood, making it much easier to start a fire. If Neanderthals intentionally ground this mineral into a fine powder to facilitate combustion, it would indicate advanced cognitive skills, including complex planning, foresight, and an understanding of chemical reactions. The ability to start fires on demand, rather than relying on natural sources, would have given them control over warmth, cooking and protection in an unforgiving environment. But could manganese dioxide have served a dual purpose? The same sites that yielded evidence of its use in fire starting also suggest its application in body decoration. If Neanderthals used it to both enhance their appearance and harness fire, what does that tell us about their worldview? Perhaps their approach to chemistry was both practical and symbolic, blending survival with social or ritual expression. The most common explanation is that these bits of manganese oxide were collected for their colouring characteristics and employed in body ornamentation and for symbolic expression. Indeed, more and more evidence suggests that Neanderthals used pigment to beautify or disguise their bodies at least 60,000 years ago. Blocks of manganese dioxide with clear traces of use wear, including some fashioned into crayons, have been discovered in at least 70 Neanderthal sites. They utilize charcoal similarly and appeared to prefer black over red or yellow shades. The use of natural adhesives among Neanderthals is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for their technical ingenuity. Birch bark tar, an early synthetic material, was used to affix stone tools to wooden handles. Unlike naturally sticky substances like resin, birch tar requires a complex process of dry distillation, heating the bark in an oxygen-starved environment to extract the adhesive properties. This technique suggests not only intelligence, but an ability to experiment and refine their methods over time. Researchers discovered the prehistoric glue by paying close attention to something others had overlooked. Several stone artifacts, believed to be hunting tools, that were unearthed in 1910 at the French archaeological site of Le Moustier. The researchers suggest this site supported Neanderthal life between 40,000 and 120,000 years ago a time known as the Rhys Glaciation. The neglected artefacts, which had never been studied in detail, had been sitting in the collections of the Museum of Prehistory and Early History in Berlin since the 1960s, individually wrapped. Le Moustier I, discovered in 1908, is famous for yielding one of the most well-preserved Neanderthal skeletons, a juvenile male estimated to be around 45,000 years old. The skull exhibits key Neanderthal traits, such as a large nasal cavity and an occipital bun, but also subtle variations that may reflect the developmental stages of the species. This skull, however, 
has endured a tragic history. Sold to the Ethnological Museum of Berlin, it was repeatedly handled, reconstructed, and ultimately damaged during World War II. The repeated casting, varnishing, and gluing of teeth into incorrect positions have diminished its scientific value, yet it remains a crucial piece of the Neanderthal puzzle. Nonetheless, the findings from Le Moustier indicate that Neanderthals used a mixture of bitumen and ochre to create a sticky, workable mass. This adhesive was not just for practicality, it was optimized for tool making, allowing blades to be secured firmly without excess residue interfering with the user's grip. If they understood the chemical interactions between ochre and bitumen, does that suggest an advanced form of chemistry? It is also likely that the Neanderthals had to do some experimenting while creating this glue, searching for the right concentrations of ochre and bitumen that stuck just right. Researchers were surprised that the ochre content was more than 50%. This is because air-dried bitumen can be used unaltered as an adhesive, but loses its adhesive properties when such large proportions of ochre are added. They followed in the Neanderthals' ways, mixing different amounts of the two substances to find the right combination that would allow them to adhere to a tool without making their own hands too sticky and impossible to work with. The sweet spot, they found, was a 55% ochre, 45% liquid bitumen pairing. Additionally, pine resin appears to have also played a large role in Neanderthal craftsmanship. The resin's flammable and waterproofing properties made it useful for sealing objects, while its sticky nature likely aided in tool production. Neanderthals may have used pine resin to coat surfaces, insulate materials, glue hides together, and make waterproof seams for clothing and shoes, and even as a rudimentary antiseptic for treating wounds. Based on this evidence, the use of birch tar is a clear result of their extensive arboreal knowledge. Neanderthals produced birch bark tar by at least 150,000 years ago. Pine trees, which grow in temperate climates, have long been used to extract resin. Pine resin was used to waterproof, seal boats, and heal wounds. The resin could be distilled into tar or pitch, which was used to seal containers, baskets, and canoes. It was also used as a natural adhesive and a medicinal agent to treat infections. Birch trees, which can be found in temperate regions throughout Europe and Asia, were harvested for their tar and resin. Heating the bark produced birch tar, which was used as a natural adhesive, particularly in tool-making, such as attaching stone blades to wooden handles. It was also used to waterproof items and as a medicinal treatment for skin infections and wounds. Pine cones and yew trees were important resources for early humans in many parts of the world, serving as fire starters, tool makers, construction materials, and even medicinal and cultural practices. Early human survival and cultural practices relied heavily on pine cones and yew trees. Pine cones served as efficient fire starters because of their flammability and the resin they contained, while the yew tree provided strong, durable wood that was valued for crafting bows, tools, and other essential items. Pine cones are highly flammable due to their structure and the natural resins found in the wood, making them excellent for starting fires. Pine cones, when dried, can easily ignite and burn steadily, allowing early humans to start fires for warmth, cooking, and protection. Pine cones burn hot and fast, providing an immediate source of heat when other types of kindling or fuel were scarce. This made them useful for starting campfires or as the initial spark in larger fires. Pine trees produce resin, which can be extracted from either the cones or the tree itself. This resin is not only extremely flammable, but it also serves as a natural accelerant. It would have been collected and used to help start and sustain fires, especially in wet conditions where other materials may struggle to catch fire. Pine wood, which is relatively soft and abundant, would commonly used to build shelters, tools, and simple furniture. Its ease of use made it an adaptable material for many early cultures. Pine resin was used for a variety of purposes other than starting fires. It could be boiled down to make tar or pitch, which was used to seal baskets, containers, and even boats. Pine resin was also used as an adhesive in tool making, particularly to secure stone tools to wooden handles. Taken together, these discoveries at Peche de Laz and Le Moustier challenge outdated assumptions about European Neanderthals. They were not just scavengers living in the shadow of early Homo sapiens, 
they were innovators, chemists, and artists in their own right. Their use of pigments, adhesives, and fire starters suggests an ability to manipulate their environment in ways once thought exclusive to modern humans from Africa. What does this mean for our understanding of human evolution? Were Neanderthals truly so different from us, or did they possess a form of intelligence that, while distinct, was no less sophisticated? If Neanderthals had not gone extinct, would they have continued to refine their chemical and artistic traditions, leading to a parallel but different form of civilization? But if they shared our constructive instincts, they also likely shared our destructive tendencies. These questions remain open, but one thing is certain. The more we learn about Neanderthals, the more we recognize the depth of their intelligence, their adaptability, and their cultural complexity.